This drawing that you see in front of you was done by a four-year-old boy who was born to a home where there had been a marriage breakup and left behind three very sad children. And this little boy interpreted what he saw around him in this, the destruction of a family home. That little boy was me. Here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so that was me, and I did hundreds, maybe thousands, of these drawings of burning houses. My mother was quite concerned. She thought maybe I should take him to a psychologist, but then she decided that I was doing it all on my own. I was working it out. And sure enough, that's what I was doing. The next spring, I had an ear operation. And while I was recovering at home, with my ear all bandaged up like a little Van Gogh, my mother had bought a little cherry tree. And she asked me to sit in the garden window and watch as she planted this tree. Seeing that tree introduced me to joy. And I connected with it in such a huge way, uh, anticipating the blossoms, the fruit that would come, most importantly, the pies that would come from these cherries. <laughs> and from that tree, I started connecting with all the fruit trees I would see around the neighborhood. And they're always in the gardens of these beautiful old houses. And I fell madly in love with these beautiful old homes and their gardens. And so I started gardening very soon. Uh, I started growing pumpkins. I thought they were beautiful. I hadn't quite figured out that people did things to them at Halloween. I just thought they were a beautiful thing. So the first year I grew them, uh, I had about six or so. And when it was time to harvest, I took them all inside and put them in my bed. And I slept with them like they were teddy bears. <laughs> and one night, one of them fell off the bed and the stem broke off, and I was just heartbroken. But that was my only little regression in sadness. Um, at school, I was consumed by drawing. My art teachers left me on my own. And they said, we can't teach you anything. So I was always drawing unto myself. And out of the school window, there was a particular old house that I was just madly in love with. It had the little perfect orchard. and. It was so, that's where I imagined living. And I said to my friends, one day I'm going to live in that house. And uh, they thought, oh yeah, right, sure. No, I will, I will. By grade seven, I was exhibiting, and my first show was in New York. I was chosen amongst many young people from around the world to uh, show their work at the United Nations. And that was thrilling and it started my professional career. And after that, I was showing in Los Angeles and drawing all the time. I was a very good boy. I never had teen years, so to speak. I just did my work and mowed people's lawns. And Kids at school usually called me suckhole <laughs> <laughs> because I was nice and well-behaved and got a lot of attention for my work, so they were just resentful. But uh, as I got older, I realized that I needed to evolve. So I started on a mission to alter myself and become cool, which meant I didn't talk anymore. It was just <laughs> attitude. And the beautiful houses that I was obsessed with, I stopped drawing them and got into more Mm, figurative but loose and cartoony and pop art and all that sort of thing, very light-hearted work. And then in my early 20s, I met the love of my life. It was 1983. It was love at first sight. It was all the cliches. Um, my soulmate. And after a year of being together, we decided we'd move to Toronto. But just before we left, he 
got sick. And it was sort of odd. And before we left, he went to the doctor and he said, maybe you should be tested for the HIV antibody. So he was tested. And the results were sent to Toronto. When we had moved in, settled down, they arrived, and he was, in fact, positive. It was uh, a shock. He was the first person I knew to have it. It had been lingering on the edges, hearing about it. It was called gay cancer. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to lose him, because it seemed like a death sentence. We pressed on, we kept living, uh, enjoying our careers. He's a very talented musician, singer, composer. And we never let it stop us. We looked after our health and just moved forward. After a few years in Toronto, I was uh, invited to do a show in Vancouver, and uh, we flew out for it. And we were staying with a friend I said, oh, this is my old neighborhood. There's this really neat old house. I wonder if it's still there. So I went for a walk, and that house that I had fell in love with as a kid was still there, and it was still perfect. And uh, my friend said, yeah, that's a great house. I said, yeah. About two weeks later, there was a going away party for us, and my friend came by and said, you're not going to believe this, but that house? He said, there's a for rent sign on it. This house had not been on the market since 1912. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear. Because <laughs> now I, I really felt like a Torontonian, and I realized that by going to Vancouver, it felt really slow and charming and nice people, great friends, but it was like, yeah, I couldn't live here. And then this happened. So we went to look at the house on the way to the airport to fly back to Toronto. <laughs> We'll think about it. We'll call you when we get there. So we landed in Toronto. It was minus 26 degrees. <laughs> and Toronto had its ugliest face on, just dirty snow everywhere. And uh, before we went to sleep, of course, it was the red eye, and you have to crash. Called Vancouver and said, we're coming. We're taking the house. Making that decision probably saved David's life. It put him in position to be in the care of the best HIV care in the world. So it was a very fortuitous leap of faith that we did that. And after a couple of years of being in Vancouver, he had a series of illnesses. And we were at a little party. And this fellow that David knew from years ago, he was a uh, a health practitioner of a kind of alternative type. And he said, I can help you with that. Come to my place, and I'll make you feel better. So why not? So I gave him his number, and a few days later, David called him and said, would you, uh, you know, like to come on such such a day? I said, yeah, great, great, great. And what's the address? And then I hear David call out, Graham, what was the address of where you grew up? And I said, and I, then I hear, oh my God. <laughs> yep, it was my mom's house. And this couple had been there for 18 years at renting. And it was spring. So we arrived on the date. And first we sat in the backyard and had tea. And I sat underneath that cherry tree, planted oh so long ago. And it was in full bloom and mature. It was about that height, that's maturity. But it was just spectacular. Anyway, I was sitting right underneath it, and uh, this very nice man was a psychic also. He didn't do it professionally, but he just had this ability. And he said, it's so nice to know who I'm talking to all the time, my mother. He said, I really like your mom. And he started describing her. I said, yeah, that's her. <laughs> wow. He said, there's something she wants you to know. And I said, yeah. He said, she wants you to stop worrying because everything is actually OK. And after he said that, a light breeze came up, and the tree just rained petals. And suddenly, I was reconnected with that tree and that original joy. My 
impulse on reflection was to paint the experience, and I did. And it brought me back to a realistic way of painting and that joy in not being afraid to be a suckle again. <laughs> I was old enough, I didn't have to be cool anymore. My work before that incident had gotten very abstract through the AIDS crisis. We buried, I stopped counting at 30 friends that had died. There were many more, many beloved friends. The arts took a very, very heavy hit from Rudolf Nureyev to Keith Haring and beyond. And I was back doing the burnt houses, so to speak. The paintings just got darker and I etched into them with nails, all kinds of weaponry. <laughs> but thoroughly abstract and very, very, very dark. And then my encounter with my tree, and suddenly I was back. I was living again. That tree, I'm just so grateful for it. After that visit there, in the fall, the fellow that we went to see, he called me and he said, uh, we're moving. The owner is putting the house on the market and we're going to move to the Gulf Islands. And do you want to say goodbye to the house because it's been sold and it's going to be demolished? So I, I thanked him. It was so thoughtful. So I said, yes, I'll come by. All this stuff had been moved out and he was just taking the last few boxes that day. And I arrived, I walked into the backyard, and that cherry tree, he said, yeah, that happened this morning. The tree had split in half, right down to the ground. I thought, my work here is done. <laughs> and that was the end of that beautiful tree. Yesterday morning, I had a cherry tree delivered to our home. And uh, it's a weeping cherry. Very beautiful. So to honor that tree and to all of our friends, I planted. I haven't planted yet, but it's there. About five years ago, uh, David contracted cancer, and in spite of that heavy feeling that comes with a major illness. I didn't go dark. Um, I had a commission, and David asked me to do it in our home, where he was going through the treatment and laying low. He asked me if I would paint it in front of him, and it gave him something to watch. And the future was evolving, and it was an important commission. And that painting took me deeper into my original style. And that painting is almost my height. It's very, very tall. And that's the uh, Marine Building in Vancouver. David survived the cancer. And I had developed this little habit of going online and looking at real estate. Because I realized you could go into houses that were for sale anywhere in the world and and see them, and they're just beautiful. And so it was my porn. <laughs> Old houses around the world, and I quite often show them to David. Look, oh, look at this house. And then one morning, after he had told me, you should check out Powell River. He said, it's a part of it that's really old, and I had no idea. I was born and raised in Vancouver, but I knew nothing about here. And sure enough, there was my dream. <gasps> block after block of wonderful old craftsman houses. And so I checked it out regularly, just seeing what was there. And I looked into the community and I thought, wow, this is a really neat, really neat community. And then the fateful morning, I decided to visit Powell River. Look at it, and the first house that came up, I went, uh-oh. I said, hey, David, you should look at this house. Oh, no, Graham, not another house. You break my heart every time. Uh, you should look at this one. 
Well, we bought it. <laughs> we took another huge leap of faith, and right now, this spring, we bought it in spring two years ago. March 15th took possession, the Ides of March. And it's ours, and we've restored it, and we love it, and we love this community. It's given us so much in such a short time. And all just these leaps of faith, you know, daring to do it, even if it's scary, and it usually is, but you've got two choices, live or not, and we've chosen to live. And this August, we will celebrate 30 years of being together. I couldn't be happier. He's here today. Hi, David. <laughs> So thank you very much for listening. That's another important thing is to listen. And this is a wonderful opportunity to do just that. Sometimes we're just too busy to actually sit down and listen to what someone has to say. But it's very important to listen and to make leaps of faith because out of those leaps of faith come enormous change, positive change. So. Bear that in mind. Next time something crosses your mind that, oh, I shouldn't really do that, do it. <laughs>